Coming up on today's Airborne, Gamma announces first quarter 2014 airplane shipment and billing numbers. Quicksilver earns FAA acceptance for its SLSA. And the first flight of the Boeing production configuration AH-6I. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The General Aviation Manufacturers Association, GAMMA, released the industry's airplane shipments and billings for the first quarter of 2014. The total worldwide general aviation airplane shipments increased 11.9%. Billings for GA airplanes totaled $5.1 billion in the first quarter. That's up 9% from the same period last year. Piston airplane shipments increased a solid 21.4%. The number of piston airplane shipments, however, remains below the 2006 peak, where there were 600 shipments in the first quarter. Turboprop shipments declined 8.1%. Business jet shipments came in stronger, up 19.4% from the first quarter of 2013. Gamma President and CEO Pete Bunce said, quote, The GA manufacturing industry's first quarter numbers in 2014, especially the strong showing in the piston segment, are encouraging and show we can continue to climb our way out of this recession. But we remain a long way from being out of the woods, as shown by the mixed performance among sectors. End quote. Let the fun begin. The FAA has informed Quicksilver Aeronautics that their audit to produce the Sport 2S model as a special light sport aircraft has been satisfactorily concluded. The model will officially be marketed as the Sport S2SE. Quicksilver Aeronautics President Will Escucha said, quote, We are prepared to swiftly put the Sport S2SE into production as a fully built aircraft, end quote. Quicksilver Aeronautics has created extensions, which are manufacturing locations other than the headquarters factory in Temecula, California. The other two locations for full manufacturing of the S2SE are in Reserve, Louisiana and Rochester, Minnesota. Additional assembly centers are under consideration and will be established as demand requires. The Sport 2S version of the airplane is also available as an amateur built or ELSA kit. You're watching Airborne. We'll be back after these messages. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to support Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop an email to jim at aero-news.net. Boeing's AH-6I light attack reconnaissance helicopter has flown for the first time in its production configuration, moving the program another step closer to full-scale production, while continuing to prove the helicopter's close air support and attack capabilities. Boeing pilots flew the aircraft for less than 20 minutes at low speeds in a forward, rearward, and sideward flight at low elevations during a recent test. Future tests will expand the flight envelope over the next several months. The AH-6I, an advanced variant of the AH-6M helicopter operated by the U.S. Army Special Operations Forces, 
It incorporates advanced technologies from the Boeing AH-64E Apache multi-role attack helicopter. The helicopter is intended to provide close air support for land-based forces and serve as an attack platform for destroying tanks, armored vehicles, and fortifications. It's Friday at last and time for our weekly barnstorming commentary. Today, Jim is concerned that recent actions by the Navy and the FAA make aviation look foolish and petty. Here's this week's barnstorming. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Well, once again, we find our own community being its own worst enemy. And let me speak about two particular instances right now that are really sticking at me. Let's talk first about the Navy's case against Gray Green the Quarter. The Navy, not really interested in explaining things to people, has gone after the two-time, repeat, two-time commander of the United States Navy Blue Angels. The second command having come about as a result of him saving the bacon of the U.S. Navy after a previous commander had had an issue and found himself having to resign. McWhorter came in, put the team straight, acquitted himself with honor and respect and professionalism, and I have to tell you, both by my own observation as well as the hundreds of people that I work with over the course of any year in the airshow industry, very few people in the entire community have garnered the respect that McWhorter has. So why the condemnation? Why the grilling in the press? Why put out this kind of information with no substantiation and basically convict the guy in the press before a hearing can take place. Now, I have a hard time believing that McWhorter has done what's been said. I've never seen an inkling of it. I've talked to members of the team, men and women, who just kind of raise their eyebrows, shake their head, and for obvious reasons won't say a lot. But to all intents and purposes, I can't find anybody who can legitimately corroborate that anything was wrong with McWhorter's command or the atmosphere under which he commanded the United States Navy Blue Angels. It doesn't make sense. But no matter what happened, the way the Navy has handled this has been embarrassing to the Navy, embarrassing to the airshow community, and most important of all, has basically ruined the career of an honorable man. On the other side, we've got the FAA continuing to go after the UAV movement because it doesn't know what to do, but it better do something. Or to quote Mel Brooks and Blazing Saddles, gentlemen, we've got to save our phony baloney jobs. They have made it clear that UAV operations are not to be tolerated, even when those operations are used for rescue purposes to help our fellow man, even when those operations recently were used to look at very quickly damage after a tornado, to search for information about what occurred during a natural catastrophe. But no, the FAA doesn't want to hear about it. They just want to find out who did it so they can go after them. An off-repeated quote is, what's the use of a newborn babe? Well, the UAV is the newborn babe that's starting to show incredible, incredible capabilities, and the FAA does not know what to do with it. Fine, if you don't know what to do with it, get the hell out of the way so those of us who can and will and want to do something positive with it can. And until the FAA gets its act together, they should have no part of this. Let the courts do what the courts decided, that the FAA wasn't following their own rules. Let us go out and build a whole new industry, because no matter what the FAA decides, believe me, we will. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. While the Southeast United States was hammered last week by severe weather and torrential rains, the FAA continues to wallow in its self-made bureaucratic swamp. Here we go again with the use of UAVs. The FAA is looking into the use of a UAV by a storm hunter who also works as a journalist to get aerial photos and video of the damage caused by Sunday's tornado that tore through the area. FAA spokeswoman Lynn Lunsford said the agency is looking into reports that television station KATV had used a UAV to get aerial video of the damage caused by the storm. Forbes contributor Greg McNeil says that lacking formal rules regulating the use of aircraft, fining journalists and others for flying them raises serious First Amendment issues regarding freedom of the press. If the FAA takes action in this case, it will be yet another example of UAV use being challenged without any FAA regulations addressing the issue. Airborne's brought to you by some of the best sponsors in the aviation business. We'll be right back with more news. 
ADS-B will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States. But you can benefit from ADS-B today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-B out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Over the past two decades, no resource has compiled as much expert valued information about the sport plane world than the Sport Plane Resource Guide. Over 1,500 pages, hundreds of aircraft, dozens of how-tos and directories. All this and more will be coming to the sport aviation world soon with the new all-electronic and updatable Sport Plane Resource Guide for your iPad, iPhone, Kindle, tablet, PC, or other electronic devices. Get your order in now www.sportplane.com Welcome back. The $100 hamburger is pilot slang for the practice of flying far away for the sole purpose of grabbing a bite to eat at a distant airport. The check for the meal is modest, but the cost of flying your own plane to get it is usually high. In case this doesn't sound crazy enough, there's even a website dedicated to supporting this unusual activity. Each year, the 54,000 private pilot subscribers to the $100 Hamburger website are asked to put forth their candidate for the top fly-in restaurant in the United States. To be considered, a restaurant must be reviewed in the just-released book, The $100 Hamburger, 2014-2015 through 2015 edition which means they are located on an airport. Website owner John Perner said, quote, Please join me in congratulating the 26 that made the 2014 best of the best. The full list can be found on the website. Long before ultralights were born by mounting lawnmower engines to hang gliders, there was only one way to fly an airplane while sitting on the outside. It's called the breezy. The Breezy was designed and constructed in 1964 by EAA members Charlie Roloff, Bob Lepowski, and Carl Unger. It features a pair of Piper PA-12 wings and a factory new Continental C-98 engine in pusher configuration and seating for two side-by-side -side passengers aboard the welded 4130 tubing structure. One of the most universally recognized aircraft to emerge from the EAA home-built movement marks its 50th anniversary this year, and the EAA is inviting breezy owners and operators to bring their aircraft to AirVenture Oshkosh 2014, where a number of special activities are being planned. The hope is to have as many breezies fly to Oshkosh as possible for a fitting celebration. Well, that's our program. Remember to get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Please remember to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new episode of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.